You're listening to The Corbett Report. CorbettReport.com investigation more than 50 years of allegations against Jimmy Savile has detailed 34 crimes of rape and 126 indecent acts. The youngest victim, a boy of just eight. The NSPCC, who produced the report together with the police, is calling Savile one of the most prolific sex offenders it has ever come across. He targeted his victims mostly in the 1960s and 70s, at the BBC, at schools, hospitals, even a hospice. But the sexual abuse also took place as recently as four years ago. The Crown Prosecution Service has admitted that Savile could have been brought to justice while he was still alive and apologised to his many victims. David Silito reports. Jimmy Savile, a predatory sex offender. His first recorded assault, 1955. The last, 2009. Today's police report is the clearest picture yet of Savile's crimes. The numbers are bewildering. 450 people have come forward. 328 were children at the time. 214 crimes have been reported, 34 rapes. The youngest victim was eight. And on it goes. Hundreds must have known something. When I went to the BBC as an executive in <clears throat> the late 80s, about 1987, I was aware of the rumours about Jimmy Savile. I was also aware of rumours about other people. Um, there was a culture and it was a generational thing. In areas of light entertainment, behaviour was tolerated. I am, I'm, feel the reason why these women never came forward before was nobody would have believed them because Jimmy Savile raised so much money for charity and he used the money that he raised for charity as a bargaining power to buy silence from national newspapers. And if ever there was a time when someone might have blown the whistle on him, he would threaten those newspapers and those reporters that that, cha that charity money would not go to those hospitals. As the Jimmy Savile sexual abuse allegations continue to rise, questions are being asked if he was part of a much wider and select paedophile network of high-profile individuals who may have assisted Savile, helped organise abuse, cover it up or taken part in the assaults themselves. The outspoken West Bromwich East MP Tom Watson spoke out at Prime Minister's Question Time to a shocked House with a name who has been implicated with Savile. He said the name was believed to be a senior aide who is still living, with links to a former Prime Minister and to a man who imported child pornography into Britain from abroad. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to the Corbett Report podcast. I'm your host, James Corbett of CorbettReport.com, podcasting to you from the sunny climes of Western Japan here on the 13th day of April, 2015. This is episode 304 of the Corbett Report, Political Pedophilia. What we've just been watching is a series of clips concerning the case of Jimmy Savile, the BBC fixture who for decades presented Top of the Pops as well as the popular children's program Jim Will Fix It, and who, until the time of his death, was almost universally lauded in the media as a tireless campaigner for children's charities and an all-around wonderful man. Until, that is, he died, and, of, and the first cracks started to form in that facade as a few journalistic toes were dipped into the water of the cesspool of corruption that was Jimmy Savile's life. A man who for half a century serially abused, raped, sexually preyed upon children as young as eight years old, and even, according to some allegations, engaged in necrophilia, and the Jimmy Savile case is particularly instructive regarding the topic of political pedophilia that we're going to be documenting on today's podcast, because it really does encapsulate this phenomenon in a nutshell. Here we have this man who, as we now know, was widely known amongst media and political circles to be a pedophile, to be a sexual predator, a rapist, a serial abuser of children, and yet that open secret was kept from the public and was never shone, uh, there, there's no spotlight was ever shone on it during his lifetime, or at least there were a few people who tentatively asked a few questions in an interview here or there, but it never amounted to anything. And suddenly when he died, the floodgates were opened. 
This is interesting because it provides an insight into not only the phenomenon of political pedophilia generally, but also specifically how this phenomenon is perpetuated, how it operates, how political con connections and media influence can keep the, the lid on a scandal as massive as this one, with literally hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of allegedly abused children now stepping forward and now being heard after the floodgates are opened. It, it does provide that, as I say, that window of understanding as to how such a phenomenon can occur. And it is now still continuing to be documented in that media that so signally abdicated its most basic duty to uh, serve the public interest in those decades when those same reporters who are now reporting on this phenomenon knew that it was taking place. So just to document just the, that piece of what I'm talking about, let's just turn to a couple of pieces of the puzzle that help to explain how Jimmy Savile did manage to perpetuate his, uh, his regime of abuse for so many decades. And we can see it from the likes of his not only, of course, wealthy and powerful entertainment friends or his employers and handlers in the BBC and uh, the, the media generally, but also his political connections and his connections that go all the way up to royalty. For example, we have uh, this from The Telegraph uh, on the 4th of October 2012. Sir Jimmy Savile, Prince Charles's love for Savile's ladies. The Prince of Wales sent Jimmy Sa Sir Jimmy Savile a Christmas card in which he asked him to give my love to your ladies in Scotland. Which reads, in light of ITV's damning documentary about Sir Jimmy Savile's sexual abuse of girls, the Prince of Wales may regret the closeness of their friendship. On one Christmas card that Prince Charles sent to the television presenter who, as we now know, was interviewed by police in 2007, he wrote, Jimmy, with affectionate greetings from Charles, give my love to your ladies in Scotland. We also have uh, this just coming out just uh, two months ago. Again, from The Telegraph, 3rd of February, 2015. Charles' biography, Eight Most Interesting Disclosures About Prince of Wales. Prince Charles trusted Jimmy Savile on everything from marriage guidance to checking speeches, among biographer Catherine Meyer's claims. Quote, fresh evidence of the extent to which the Prince of Wales relied on Jimmy Savile as a confidant and advisor is revealed for the first time in a controversial royal biography published later this week. The prince asked Savile to read over his speeches and to provide his thoughts on how they might be improved, as well as asking his advice on matters to do with health policy. Charles, The Heart of a King, by the journalist Catherine Meyer, explores the relationship between the prince and Savile, now known to have abused hundreds of children. Savile, who died in 2011, was for years a visitor to Highgrove and St. James's Palace. He also had the run of Stoke Mandeville Hospital, Leeds General Inf Infirmary, and Broadmoor, which, to the prince, made Savile an obvious person to tap on for advice on navigating Britain's health authorities. Mayor recounts an occasion at Highgrove where health officials were gobsmacked to arrive for a meeting about the proposed closure of emergency services at a local hospi hospital to find Savile at the table. He was said to have threatened the health bosses after the prince left, saying that making them unha unhappy could cost them a knighthood. The article continues from there, and there are many, many, many more articles detailing connections between Savile and various members of the British aristocracy, media establishment, and, uh, and political circles generally. I won't go into the, that specifically at the moment. I will put in a link in the show notes to a good activ activistpost.com article from a couple of years ago that goes through some of those connections and opens the door, the Pandora's box that is this scandal. But I think the Jimmy Savile scandal really did open the floodgates on a number of levels, including into some other investigations that are continuing to have profound ramifications and hopefully long-lasting ones on the face of British politics. And it was that knock-on effect that the Jimmy Savile case had in opening up the Westminster VIP pedophile ring scandal in the UK that was in part responsible for me posting on CorbettReport.com on January 11th, 2015, an open source investigation into pedophiles in politics. The link, of course, will be in the show notes for this podcast at CorbettReport.com in case you have not visited this article, which is uh, an attempt to provide some of the overview of not only the Westminster scandal, but some other 
uh, pedophile ring scandals in political circles, but more importantly, it is a collection of, at this precise moment that I'm recording this, 140 comments compiled by dozens and dozens and dozens of CorbettReport.com members. Almost every single one of these comments containing multiple links to newspaper articles, uh, court filings and documents, official investigation records, uh, videos, and testimony of abuse victims. Uh, just an absolute compendium of information in here that I could not possibly even attempt to encapsulate in a podcast episode like this. So that is not what I'm going to attempt to do today. I will urge you, 100% urge you, if you have not done so, please read through that article and the accompanying comments to get an idea of the amount of information that we are dealing with here. Now, as I say, it would be a disservice to this information for me to attempt to encapsulate all of these various links in a short podcast like this. So... Rather than doing a disservice to that information, I will invite you, exhort you to look through it on your own time to get a sense of just how overwhelming the amount of data on this subject is in the public record already, let alone what is continuing to spill out uh, through a lot of investigations that are taking place right now. And in this brief moment of opportunity where we per potentially, perhaps, can actually expose some of these scandals that have been building for decades and well let's see if we can push these scandals and uh, to their break breaking point and actually help to make sure that there are profound transformations that take place as a result of these exposures in order to do that today on the podcast we're going to be presenting political pedophilia an open source investigation that i've compiled from that information on the website so in this presentation we are going to be looking at examples of the political pedophilia phenomenon. We're going to be explaining why pedophilia is seemingly so rampant in political circles. We're going to be offering ideas as to what people can effectively do about this when public institutions are so obviously compromised. And we are going to present a warning about how to avoid making this investigation into a blind witch hunt which could so easily happen considering we are dealing with some of the most raw and basic instincts of humankind, that is to protect our children. So there are, of course, warnings to be heeded about the ways these types of open source investigations can proceed. And we will be wrapping up today's presentation with some thoughts on that. But let's get into the examination of the disgusting details of at least a few of these examples, uh, these cases, starting with that VIP uh, pedophile ring, which is continuing to be exposed in the UK. It wasn't that long ago that those who claimed that there was a massive pedophile ring involving officials in the highest levels of government were written off as conspiracy theorists and kooks. That is no longer the case, at least in the UK. It turns out that this so-called conspiracy theory was true and is finally being officially investigated. A powerful elite of at least 20 prominent establishment figures formed a VIP paedophile ring that abused children for decades. Senior politicians, military figures and even people linked to the royal family are among the alleged abusers. For years, children's rights campaigners have been drawing attention to the existence of paedophile rings among Britain's political elite. Previously dismissed as a conspiracy theory by the establishment, MPs in Parliament are now raising the issue and demanding answers about allegations of paedophiles operating in Westminster during the 1980s. Labour MP Simon Danjuk has called on Leon Britton to make public what he knew about a dossier of allegations about paedophiles which was presented to him when he was Home Secretary between 1983 and 1985. Many of the accusations centred around the behaviour of former Liberal MP Cyril Smith, who died in 2010. Cyril Smith was a celebrated figure who wooed the voters. He was Rochdale's Liberal MP during the 70s and 80s. His popularity made him one of the country's most high-profile politicians. Smith's name resurfaced last year during the Savile scandal, which led to a re-examination of the way sex abuse cases are handled and their victims dealt with. The Crown Prosecution Service admitted the MP should have been charged in his lifetime. 
A film for dispatches tonight will show just how many opportunities were missed to stop him. Lancashire police carried out several investigations in the late 1960s and compiled this 80-page file, kept from the public until tonight. This shows the police were more than ready to prosecute him. And yet they weren't able to. In the file, police complain of veiled threats from local Liberals. Smith himself is accused of pressurising witnesses to withdraw their statements. The then local MP, Jack McCann, even spoke to the Director of Public Prosecutions on Smith's behalf. And shortly afterwards, the case was dropped. Now that gives us at least a hint as to the scope of this investigation that is now ongoing into the pedophile ring that seems to go straight up into Parliament and uh, some of the highest circles of political power in the UK. But it is just a hint, and we don't really know the full extent of this scandal yet, as it does continue to develop. But let's take a look at some of the pieces of evidence. So we know that high, the highest levels of UK politics, royalty, military, and intelligence agencies have been alleged to be involved in this pedophile ring. There was a dossier on pedophiles that allegedly that were allegedly associated with the British government. It was submitted to Home Secretary Leon Britton in 1984 but somehow or other got missing in the bowels of the, uh, the, the parliament. So the whereabouts of that dossier to this day still unknown. Thatcher administration stopped officials from publicly naming suspected pedophiles. MI5 is alleged to have repeatedly blocked investigations into this child abuse ring. And as of March 2015, the Independent Police Complaints Commission, the IPCC, said it is looking at 17 allegations of a police cover-up relating to the VIP child sex abuse ring between the 1970s and 2000s. As I say, this is an ongoing case, uh, and we don't have all of the facts yet. We still don't even quite know the scope of this investigation, as even just a few days ago, there are still bombshells that continue to drop. We have, for example, this from channel4.com, Kinkora historic VIP pedophile ring shock allegations saying that a, a Kinkora abuse victim from Northern Ireland has told Ch Channel 4 News how he was also abused at London's Elm Guest House and Dolphin Square at the hands of very powerful people. Quote, Richard Kerr's harrowing account of what happened to him as a boy links three of the most important alleged VIP pedophile ring locations for the first time. Dolphin Square, a luxury complex popular with MPs and civil servants, Kinkora Boys' Home in Belfast, where boys were systematically abused, and Elm Guest House, a former gay brothel where young children are also said to have been molested. So, you will be forgiven if it is difficult to keep track of all the different headlines with all of these different pedophile rings that are now being exposed in the UK, because it looks like they may actually be all connected. And I don't think there should be much surprise in that, given one would suspect the high levels of political and media and other types of influence that would be needed to keep the lid on a, a pedophile ring like this operating for decades with seeming complete impunity. It is interesting that this is now coming to light and that there are now active investigations into this. And as I say, it is a moving target. And uh, just another example of that, we had uh, just recently the ex-chief constable of the Lancashire police coming out and charging, again, a, a specific charge of cover-up in the case of Cyril Smith, who we heard about in that video clip montage that we just watched. Uh, a retired chief constable has revealed that a sinister cover-up of the crimes of pedophile MP Cyril Smith was ordered by a top official working for the Director of Public Prosecutions. Albert Laharn, former chief constable of Lancashire Police, said that in the 1970s he was asked to lie about the 29-stone liberal politician's alleged sexual abuse of a boy. The 83-year-old is the highest-ranking ex-officer yet to give details of an establishment conspiracy to protect Smith. It follows a week of revelations on how the MP's powerful friends hid the truth about his reign of abuse. So, as I say, this is an ongoing story, an unfolding story, a moving target, if you will, and I don't suspect we have seen the last of this. We may, unfortunately, start to see these types of investigations being led down 
dead alleys, blind alleys, or being put into inquiries that ultimately result in nothing. But at least at, for the time being, there are still revelations coming out and still witnesses coming forward. So this is something of a, uh, a motion, a, a, some, a story in motion, and one that we will obviously have to continue to track as it continues to unfold. But of course, the UK VIP pedophile ring is by no means the only VIP pedophile ring that is coming to light at this time. There is another one that is making headlines, and deservedly so, relating to a former uh, high, high-rolling high financier, jet-setting globe, uh, globetrotter named Jeffrey Epstein. What has been the biggest scandal in the UK since World War II has now come to the US, and it may involve former President Bill Clinton. The story surrounds this man, billionaire Jeffrey Epstein, who served time in 2008 for soliciting prostitution. That charge came as part of a plea deal. It all began in 2005 when Epstein was investigated after a woman reported that he paid her 14-year-old daughter $300 for sex. And since that initial claim, there have been more than 40 women who have come forward with claims that Epstein is a sexual predator and that he not only abused them, but shared them with famous and powerful friends. Well, flash forward to today and a lawsuit is underway in Palm Beach, Florida. In that lawsuit, multiple mentions of former President Bill Clinton, who reportedly took multiple trips to Epstein's private island. You see it here. It's called Little St. James. It all happened between 2002 and 2005. Now, according to testimony in the lawsuit, at least one woman on that compound was there unwillingly. She is referred to as Jane Doe 102. She was forced to live as one of Epstein's underage sex slaves for years and was forced to have sex with politicians, businessmen, royalty, people working in academics, etc. Now, to be clear, in 2008, when the plea deal happened, Clinton cut off ties to Epstein, but maybe not. According to the UK Daily Mail, the lawsuit claims that Clinton was friends with an unnamed woman who kept images of naked, underage children on her computer. So what did Bill Clinton know? And what was he a part of? According to the smoking gun, as part of a civil suit filed against Epstein by several of his victims, lawyers for the women floated the possibility of subpoenaing Clinton, since he might well be a source of relevant information about Epstein's activities. Now, while Clinton was never deposed, lawyers obtained Epstein's computerized phone directory, which included email addresses for Clinton, along with 21 phone numbers for him, including those for his assistant, Doug Band, according to a court filing. Some very interesting and revealing details there about the connections of Jeffrey Epstein to people like Bill Clinton, and not just Bill Clinton. And we can garner that from the story of the, the incredible story of the black little black book that was stolen from Jeffrey Epstein by his houseman, whatever that means, uh, who, who took those... Uh, took the, the, the black book containing the different phone numbers and addresses of individuals related to Epstein, and, uh, well, uh, according to the police, were, uh, was attempting to use it as blackmail against Epstein, but still, the names in that uh, little black book should be, well, familiar to people. For one, there's a lot of very familiar household names in there, including the likes of Mick Jagger and John Cleese and Barbara Walters and Mike Wallace and others. But uh, the perhaps the interesting part of that is that in the Black Book, which you can go and download, there is a PDF document online that you can actually see the actual uh, document. It has all of the phone numbers of the individuals redacted, of course, but it does actually list all of the individuals in this Black Book. And some of the other names in this book should, well, ring some alarm bells for viewers of the Corbett Report, including a... Uh, certain David Rockefeller and uh, also people like Peter Soros and uh, Ehud Barak, former prime minister of Israel. Very interesting names that appear in that black book. But it should be noted that it's not being suggested by anyone, really, that every single contact that Jeffrey Epstein had in this black book was participating in whatever pedophile uh, parties Epstein was throwing. It's that these people all associated with with Epstein, even up to and including the time where he was uh, coming under suspicion for these activities. Um, and there's an excellent post on 
1984 Arkansas Mother of the Year dot blogspot dot com, which I will put in the f- uh, show notes for this episode that compiles dozens and dozens and dozens of links uh, to various court documents and filings and uh, and articles about this story uh, called the VIP Pedophile Friends of Mega Pedophile Jeffrey Epstein that uh, I think is required reading for people who want to know more about this case and specifically about the people who were circled in this black book. Um, uh, there are a number of people who are circled because this houseman, Alfredo Rodriguez, believed these were the people who were participating in the pedophilia uh, with Epstein, including um, people who you might, might not have heard of before, uh, Flavio Briatore, the, uh, with an estimated net worth of $150 million, a Formula One racing manager, uh, Jean-Luc Brunel, um, who in the modeling industry, surprise, surprise, and uh, some other names that you probably will be familiar with, who, again, were circled as what Alfredo Rodriguez believed to be uh, participating in these pedophile parties, including uh, Bill Richardson, the former governor of New Mexico, Ehud Barak, the former prime minister of Israel, Alan Dershowitz, uh, who, according to an undisputed statement of fact filed by the victim's lawyers in April of 2011, said uh, Epstein's housekeeper Alfredo Rodriguez, uh, Rodriguez testified that Dershowitz stayed at Epstein's house during the years when Epstein was assaulting minor females on a daily basis, and Dershowitz was at Epstein's house at times when underage females were there being molested by Epstein. Other names on that uh, list of uh, people who had, were identified by Rodriguez as participating in these parties include Car- Courtney Love, uh, Peter Soros, the aforementioned Peter Soros, nephew of George Soros, and uh, Les Waxner, a huge Republican PAC donor, amongst others. Again, information about those charges, those allegations, who these people are, and uh, again, dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens of links are available from that article that I cited and will put in the show notes for this episode. So the Epstein scandal also continues to be something of a moving target as there are still developments ongoing. Of course, I'm sure people will have seen the headlines that linked Prince Andrew to this scandal, although the latest is that Prince Andrew has been removed from the victim's uh, lawsuit about this scandal. Um, as the court deemed that Prince Andrew, the, the charges, the allegations about Prince Andrew were not relevant to that filing, interestingly. But it should be noted that this filing, this ongoing court case that's going on, is related to the extraordinary terms of the extraordinary plea deal that Epstein managed to, uh, to pr- put forward in this case with the help of Alan Dershowitz, uh, who managed to get this plea deal where he had... I believe it was 16 hours per day of uh, uh, being basically free to to live in his own mansion. And uh, he served a grand total of 13 months. um, And and basically this was pled down to almost nothing without the knowledge or participation of the victims, or at least that's what this court uh, filing is alleging. So a very interesting, and as I say, again, an ongoing moving target uh, as to what's going to occur in this case. But Of course, it should be noted, Bill Clinton was best friends with Jeffrey Epstein for a considerable period of time, uh, including the time in which Epstein was holding these parties and was a confirmed guest on Epstein's uh, private jet and was uh, multiply listed by Epstein in his private phone directory. So clearly, Bill Clinton has some questions that need to be answered about his participation with Epstein in this scandal. All right, again, going through this whirlwind, continuing to document some political pedophilia scandals of note, let's look at the case of Joris Demink. Much like a courtroom, these witnesses presented their testimonies to a Capitol Hill audience, but the man they accuse has yet to stand trial. I was afraid to say no. And I was very young and innocent. That is the voice of a grown man describing emotional scars from childhood. His identity is protected because he barely survived an assassination attempt. That attack followed his allegations against what's been called the Dutch super elite. At 14 years old, he left his family in Turkey to find work in Europe. Instead of a job, he found trouble and was blackmailed into working at an Amsterdam brothel. That's where he says he met this Dutchman, George Demink, a high-ranking government official. The second time that we met, he wanted me to go with him to his home in The Hague. 
He claims he was forced to have sex with Demink, who now heads the Dutch Ministry of Security and Justice, a position the victim's lawyer says keeps him from being prosecuted. We can have nice laws in the Netherlands, but what when high elite people uh, uh, abuse uh, uh, children and they are not prosecuted. Why do you have your laws? The Dutch government acknowledged investigating several complaints against Demink, both in the Netherlands and Turkey, dating back to the 1990s. And its official finding? The outcome of these investigations has always been that the rumors and allegations are utterly baseless. When I first met Demink, he asked me for my age and I said to him, I was 15 years old. Joris Demink asked me to have anal sex and he really wanted to force me to do that. He was sent by Professor Van Roon to a car with a chauffeur and a man in it named Joris, that this man, and uh, of which later said I recognize him as being Mr. Deming. Uh, while the uh, private driver was driving, uh, he wanted to have oral sex. Deming never came out of the car. He always stayed in the car because he don't want to be seen in those places. He was a very high uh, level person and that was the reason he didn't want to go into these bars where all these young uh, uh, boys worked and where all these pedophiles uh, uh, came together. The second time I was with Deming, it was also in his car. And then he wanted to drive to The Hague, to this house, to have anal sex with me. Another chilling case, this time from the Netherlands. So just to recap some of the details of this case, there was an investigation that was launched into an alleged net pedophile network in Amsterdam in the 1990s, uh, a police investigation called the Rolodex Affair that was shut down shortly afterwards, uh, which of course raised accusations of cover-up, as it should. Um, then in November of 2002, Joris Demink was appointed as Secretary General of the Justice Ministry in the Netherlands. There were three separate rape and sexual misconduct charges filed against Demick in 2008 and 2010 by two boys in Turkey. But a criminal investigation never took place. Uh, Demick's travel movements during the time in question have never been made public, and the Turkish charges were later dismissed. Now, the Demink affair is a fascinating one because it leads into uh, a, a, the heart of the story that we've talked about on this program before. For example, in uh, the presentation that I gave in the Netherlands on Gladio B, you might remember that one of the people mentioned in that presentation was Hussein Bibison, and he figures in Demink's story as well. Let's take just a short extract from a very important article in I, on isgp.nl, a website that was highly recommended in that comment section of the open source investigation on corbettreport.com by multiple users, and which we will reference again before the end of this episode. But on October 31st, 2014, isgp.nl posted, The Netherlands in Perspective, Demink Affair Reveals the Supranational Politics of Heroin, Cocaine, Blackmail, and Deception. I'm just reading one very small ex extract from that very long and very thorough article. In April 2007, Demink again reached the evening news. This time, lawyers Adel van der Plaas and husband Peter Bakker Schutt sued Demink on behalf of their client, the Kurd Hussein Bibison locked up in a Dutch jail on d drug trafficking charges. Van der Blas and Schutt claim that their client, which they have had since at least 2002, is completely innocent. He was locked up by the Dutch authorities after pressure from the Turkish government. Personal pressure, actually, because the Turkish government supposedly has evidence that Joris Demink raped boys in Turkey in the 1990s. If Demink wouldn't see to it that Bibison was put away, they would start revealing evidence. Now, Again, this is much too detailed to get into the, all of the specifics here, but Bibison, an interesting connection into the Gladio case and the uh, prospect of NATO drug running. Um, so again, there's some interesting connections there that I hope to draw out in the future. And I do, I am attempting to set up an interview that will get a little further into the heart of the Deming story and some of the connections there in the near future. But proceeding, let's detail another uh, case of political pedophilia, one that I think is more well-known amongst alternative media circles, but still, of course, largely unknown to the general public, and that is the Franklin scandal. A 
Republican from the Midwest, Lawrence E. King, is serving a 15-year prison sentence for a multi-million dollar fraud. But financial crime is only half the story. This is the true story of Lawrence King. It is the story of an evil at the heart of America, of a cover-up at the highest level. One man is attempting to uncover the full story. John DeCamp is among the most highly decorated Vietnam veterans. A former Republican state senator in Lincoln, Nebraska, he is now a lawyer fighting the legacy of Lawrence King's evil network. It's a web of intrigue that starts in our holy of holies, Boys Town, Nebraska, one of the most respected institutions in the United States, and spreads out like a spider web to Washington, D.C., right up to the steps of the nation's capital, the steps of the White House, involves some of the most respected and powerful and richest businessmen in this United States of America. And the centerpiece of the entire web is the use of children for sex and drug dealing and drug couriers, the compromising of politicians, the compromising of businessmen, but worst of all, the corruption of key institutions of government that have the duty and responsibility to make sure these things never happen. Some of the parties when they started off were straight political type parties with no sex. So you were in the White House? Yes. How did you gain access? Well, I came down with uh, Larry King. What and time of night? It was usually around uh, midnight and it was kind of a, a gift for our services that we were doing. Larry King was the facilitator. That was the man that was in charge. I mean, we flew with him on the trips, had flown to Chicago, was in a hotel room. I was dressed in a negligee. There were, I believe, prominent men, a lot of young boys at this hotel performing certain things sexually with other men, and men ejaculated or masturbated in front of me. Again, that's just a short clip showing some of the accusations relating to the scandal, the Franklin cover-up, the uh, also known as the Boys Town scandal. Absolutely incredible, some of the information that has been released about this. Just going over some of the details, the scandal actually originated with the collapse of the Franklin Community Credit Union in Omaha, which was directed by Larry King. No, not that Larry King. Lawrence E. King, who was a rising star in the Republican Party at the time. In the 1980s, the Nebraska Senate opened an inquiry into where the money had gone with this FCCU scandal, and by 1988, it instead found itself questioning young adults and teenagers who said that they had been child prostitutes in service of powerful business moguls and politicians. Uh, the uh, We saw some clips from the Conspiracy of Silence documentary, a documentary that was filmed um, but never aired due to pressure from the network, um, which exposed a network of high-level religious leaders and politicians who flew children around the country to participate in sex parties, some of which were, were allegedly hosted by King. And in 1982, Paul Bonacci, uh, one of the uh, victims, claims that he and others were flown to Bohemian Grove to participate in orgies and other acts of child abuse. In July 1990, then Chief Investigator Gary Caradori and his son were killed in a mysterious plane crash, and in 1999, John DeCamp represented Bonacci in a lawsuit filed against Lawrence E. King. Bonacci won a million dollars in compensa compensatory and punitive damages to be paid by King, who has only served jail time for bank fraud. And this goes into a lot of other stories, including the Washington Times homosexual prostitution inquiry and snares VIPs with Reagan Bush and other such um, headlines that come sometimes and go very quickly, uh, perhaps obviously and, and uh, predictably so. Uh, there's, again, so much more to say about the Franklin scandal. I did cover it in episode 39 of the Corporate Report podcast, who is Jeff Gannon, so you might want to go back to that to refresh yourself with some of the details. 
And again, there's more information in the comment section of that open source investigation on CorbettReport.com, as well as plenty more links to all sorts of different stories from around the world. Suffice it to say, this is not an isolated phenomenon. This is not something that we are looking with one particular child abuse ring in one particular country. We are looking at something that seems to be a widespread and persistent phenomenon and has been so for decades at the very least. And of course, this raises the question of why? Why do we continue to see these types of scandals, particularly these types of scandals, pedophilia, uh, cropping up with such frequency in the highest political offices? Is there some reason for this? Can we explain this phenomenon by recourse to to things in the public domain. And I, I believe there is. And in order to start getting a handle on this, let's take a look at a very interesting comment that was left on the uh, the open source investigation into uh, pedophiles and politics on CorbettReport.com by CorbettReport.com member and previous guest on the program, Dr. Cheard Andringa of the University of Groningen, a professor of cognitive sciences, who drew on his time and research uh, in the cognitive sciences to leave this, I think, very informative comment on this open source investigation. He entitled that Maintaining a Cacistocracy, and he wrote, One of the reasons for the intimate association of the power elite with child abuse is that they might use it to maintain their somewhat hidden cacistocracy. Cacistocracy is government by the worst and most evil people, a highly capable brand of psychopaths, if you like. Psychopathy is only mildly hereditary, so an elite psychopath cannot guarantee that sons or daughters will be just as psychopathic. I expect this entails that they need a steady resupply of ruthless and power-hungry individuals who understand the world deeply and pervasively and, as such, are highly capable. Normally deep and pervasive understanding leads to wisdom and a sense of responsibility, humility even. But that is precisely not what the cacistocracy needs. It needs the same depth and pervasiveness of understanding but in combination with utter ruthlessness and the capacity to appear respectable. Enter child abuse. By abusing children, you give them an attachment disorder by violating or destroying the deep sense of security that is the basis for an open attitude toward learning and discovering. With this trust violated, the child's world changes from a world of opportunities to a world of potential and actual threats. And often they will search and serve those who can protect them from these threats, and in doing so, giving their autonomy away for life. And they might even carry it over to their children, stultifying their growth towards autonomy. Aristocrats and priests must have discovered a long time ago that abused children lead to useful servant adult, adult servants. Slaves, actually. And while this is despicable to people with a normal moral development, it is a positive thing for psychopaths who see other people as tools anyway. Yet this does not solve the problem of keeping the cacistocracy supplied with respectable-appearing, super-high-functioning, and completely ruthless psychopaths. Only a small fraction of the population, say 1%, is psychopathic, and as such has the benefit of an absence of empathy and conscience. Psychopaths are able to exploit others as if they were tools. Yet the vast majority of them are not particularly evil. They can be ruthless, daring, and callous, but they find mostly norm-abiding ways to be psychopathic. They might be mountaineers, military, ER doctors, car or insurance salesmen, real estate brokers, or white-collar criminals. But most are definitely not the high-functioning individuals that compare with how the power elite see themselves and would accept as their peers. So how do you recruit suitable psychopaths in your midst if they do not advertise themselves as such? Enter child abuse again. If you organize events for the ambitious and capable in which they progressively can show that, notwithstanding their veneer of respectability, they are actually completely ruthless, you have the ideal recruiting grounds for the cacistocracy. Of course, blackmail plays a role, but the suitable candidates gladly let themselves become blackmailable because this gives them access to the inner sanctum of this cacistocracy. They prove themselves worthy members and loyal due to their blackmailability, and in return, they receive access to power in a way they could never dream of on their own. After a while, they become fully accepted to a level that suits their capabilities, and they will help to maintain that system that gave them so many opportunities and can end their respectability at any point in time. 
I think what I have sketched above is a useful framework to understand the dynamics of elite child abuse networks. It is never an incident, it is just the cacistocracy maintaining and reinvigorating itself. Business as usual. But the few moments the abuse networks become expo exposed provide an ideal opportunity to glimpse the cacistocracy at work and frantically protecting itself. Once again, that was a comment from Dr. Cheard Andringa, who I think makes a very interesting point and adds a word I'm sure to many of the listeners' lexicon, cacistocracy, rule by the worst, which I think is pretty indisputably what we are suffering under. And as a result of that, I think we can see how this pertains to that maintenance of the psychopathic class that so obviously does steer so much of politics and why child abuse is such... A, uh, a, a useful thing for them to use to maintain that cacistocracy. Of course, identifying the problem is only the first half of what we are attempting to do, which is obviously solve or eradicate the problem. And uh, in, a, in a, the course of a conversation that I recorded with Dr. Andringa last week, which is available on CorbettReport.com, and which I suggest you listen to in its entirety, I had the chance of posing the question, does the identification of this cacistocracy and the way that it functions help us to actually confront and hopefully solve this problem of child abuse? And if so, how? Um, the, moment, the, the main, the starting point would be to compile uh, more information uh, from multiple perspectives, more countries, uh, more names, more networks, um, and then maybe creating a number of information hubs. Uh, uh, ISGP is one, uh, and, and, but we need probably more uh, that, that uh, probably are already a few. Um, so that is, that is, I think, a really important first step. And then we need something uh, that resembles science on this topic. Science has the advantage that it, it is... If it, it's done well, it's done so rigorous that no one can, can really dis, uh, dispute uh, the answers. Yeah, so we, we should find a way to, to do this in a really rigorous way to make us strong. And so we have to involve a number of scientists uh, to, to advise us here and again. I'm a scientist, so I, I'd love to participate in that. Um, and then do some, some, some data mining. Uh, Make infographics, uh, build automatic or not automatic or hierarchical uh, networks of, of people and how and events and how everything relates and so, and then using that to find all kinds of patterns, uh, so that we have a, a clear modi a modus operandi for for these type of people because I, I I really believe that they have only a limited scope of behaviors that are natural for them. Um, yeah, so what. And, and, and then we need a little bit more theory. What is the mindset of the cacistocracy? What, what can they agree on among themselves? And, and what type of structures of corruption does it actually lead to? Yeah, so that we know where to look, know how to interpret these kind of things. If they show only, if we see only two steps, we can predict uh, the, 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 the other eight steps so that we eventually see pretty much everything. So that is a, that is a very important, more or less scientific part. But everyone can, can engage in that. That is, that is not, not a, it's, it's, it's just a way of doing it. It's not the persons who are doing it. Um, then associated with that is also come up with a number of theories. Uh, this is the way we can compile all these patterns, all this information together. This is the explanatory theory. And my cacistocracy story is one theory. Maybe it is possible to approach it just from regular political power influence theories. It might work just as well. Um, and then, if we have such a basis, we can generate predictions. And, and we can say, okay, we have a network uh, of people, the Bush clan, for example, they have behaved like this. Uh, they are now switching in that direction, doing these kind of things. And so we expect a certain pattern. Uh, a little bit like our previous uh, discussion about uh, climate and the weather. Uh, so what type of climate can we, can we expect from these people? Um, we can connect all kinds of events by the people that participate in them. 
or their families. Um, and, and, and explain all kinds of things in a little bit bigger context. And then eventually, or maybe at the same time, but it's always, uh, that this is, this is, well, that, that, that is the, the activism that should follow from this. And the thing that is a bit dangerous is premature activism. So if you're not really knowing what what you are doing and you're very active, you make either a fool of yourself or you align yourself with 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 uh, goals that that well are not yours eventually. And so basically, you make a fool of yourself or you misspend your time completely. Um, and then, if we compile our information really well, we can find all kinds of people who will, will actually help us: uh, victims, church groups. Uh, Amnesty International, Human, Human Rights Watch, maybe the top of them might be corrupt and, and, and not, not and self-serving, but many of the people at the bottom, they are definitely not corrupt. Um, and then, well, may, maybe simply uh, make educational material, uh, uh, make all kinds of children's stories or whatever about how to detect a political parasite and, and, and do all kinds of nice uh, things with that, also the infographics and so. And then at a certain point, if we really know what we are doing, uh, then we should make it personal, personal for the people involved. Uh, expose them, uh, make sure that they are ostracized. Um, and we can have all kinds of campaigns, the, whatever, the political parasite purging program. Uh, and uh, that that well and, and eventually uh, we we can we can we shouldn't do all the work but we can make sure we is then the alternative media and the people who are interested in that uh, but this is so big uh, that we can actually uh, elicit the help of pretty much everyone. A detailed and eminently practical plan of action from Dr. Chair Danderinga, and I would exhort you once again to go to corporatereport.com to listen to that interview in its entirety. But I think that what Dr. Andringa says there rings uh, true to me on a number of levels. First of all, he does seem to stress the open source investigation nature of what we are doing because truly the media, the political circles, the police uh, investigators and inquiries and tribunals that have taken place over the years ostensibly to guard us from these types of abuses have signally and documentably not only failed in their efforts, but actively worked to cover up these abuses. So we cannot rely on them to be the saviors. I don't think it's uh, very realistic to believe that many of these perpetrators are going to be brought to justice in the courts of law as we understand them today, unless some truly tectonic changes happen on the political scale. And unless and until those changes occur, I think it is more reasonable for us to, to do what we can to document and expose these phenomena precisely because the vast majority of the public, the overwhelming majority of humanity, is born with a moral compass and does understand that the rape and torture and sexual abuse of children and young people in our society is one of the most horrific things that it is possible for anyone to be engaged in and will ultimately discredit and uh, take away the power of those who are involved in them if they can be accurately identified and exposed for what they are. We are starting to see that occurring when it comes, for example, to the UK VIP pedophile ring. But again, unless we continue to push this information through, I don't trust that the mainstream media and the, the political inquiries that are on, ongoing will ultimately see justice done. Some people, I'm sure, will be thrown under the bus, but I, I'm sure we won't get to the root of the problem unless we continue to press this investigation forward and use all of the means at our disposal to raise awareness of this uh, amongst the general public. Because again, the general public is on our side. We just have to break through that cognitive dissonance that will mean that at least 
well, uh, half of uh, about half of Americans will say, of course not Clinton. Oh, he couldn't be involved in this. He's our president. The cognitive dissonance is extremely strong on this issue, which is why we have to do a very thorough job of documenting and detailing what we can show about the connections and relations of these various people to these pedophile rings. But I hope you did hear and heed Dr. Andringa's warning about premature activism. The idea of going off half-cocked with half-formed ideas or documents or details that aren't quite in place. We don't quite know, but we know enough to know. Premature activism can not only be uh, misguided and ultimately sending our resources in the wrong direction, but can be actually work against us. Because if we are to engage in a serious open source investigation of these issues, we have to be very meticulous in what we're documenting and very sure of our facts before proceeding in what could very easily become a witch hunt. And it's not just a question of the fact that this could become a witch hunt. I think it demonstrably has become a witch hunt in the past and will likely do so again unless and until we find ways of proceeding with these investigations in manners that uh, lead us in direction of uh, truth uh, founded on evidence. Now, what am I talking about here? Well, there have been a number of these types of cases that have come up in, in recent years that are promoted in the alternative media, some of which have more of a factual basis and some of which have less of a factual basis. Perhaps one that made a lot of headlines recently that people will be familiar with is the accusations of the rather spectacular accusations of child abuse, which included not only child sex rings, but also uh, literally cutting up and uh, serving children in um, uh, McDonald's, etc. in Hampstead uh, in, uh, in, in the UK which was, again, quickly and heavily promoted amongst certain alternative media websites before all the facts in the case had come out. Another example in recent years uh, that, again, made a lot of headlines in the alt media was the case of Holly Gregg, a young woman with Down syndrome in Scotland who was allegedly abused at, abused at the hands of a pedophile ring in Scotland, including high members of uh, the police and Freemasons and others, for decades before that came to light. And as I say, that was heavily promoted in certain sectors of the alt media, a certain online campaign trying to raise awareness of the Holly Gregg case uh, gained momentum. But that story dropped out of sight a couple of years ago and is hardly ever heard of anymore because there were certain facts that were investigated after years of this being promoted in the alt media. Some people started to actually look at the evidential basis for these claims and started to find there were significant holes in this story. Not only that some people were who were identified as being part of this pedophile ring, identified by name, don't actually exist... But some of the places that were identified as places where this abuse happened don't actually exist. Robert, um, <clears throat> in, there are various things online. You've said things online, you've said things to radio stations, to, to anyone who would listen, really. Um, you've named this pedophile ring. Um, you have... At the bottom of everything that you've written, you've said, you know, all these names are known, known to me as a result of my extensive investigations, and I believe them to be true. So, as part of this pedophile ring, the ringleader is the sheriff. He's also involved with his sister and his sister's wife. Now, Robert, being an investigator, a uh, truth ninja, as he's been called, will, of course, have made sure that these relationships exist. The truth... Tony, is that this sheriff has no sister, therefore has no brother-in-law, okay? So here are three of the main people in this pedophile ring, and two of them don't exist, okay? Now, shall I move on? Yeah, just like, uh, Anne, would you like to say anything on that, or? Oh, that's not true at all. Well, these things are very easily checkable through the register of birth, death, and marriage, marriages, and I, I urge Robert to maybe have a look at that. Now, next... Wrong sheriff there. Sorry, say that again there, Alan. <coughs> I think you must have got the wrong sheriff. No, I don't have a wrong sheriff, Anne, I'm afraid. I don't. Now, if I can just continue. Yeah, continue. It's been said, well, firstly, the allegations were made at first in 2000. 
and many of the allegations were said to have, some of the abuse was said to have taken place in the sheriff's house in Aberdeen. Um, this sheriff. Well, I, 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 I've seen some of the allegations, and it is true. Ah, that's not true. The that's not what we told you. He didn't me. live in Aberdeen until 2000. He didn't live in Aberdeen until 2000. He only moved there in 2000. These are the kind of things... We never said his house these at all. We never mentioned his house at all. Said. These are the kind of things that investigators investigate to see whether or not they can proceed with a story. Now, can I move that on? was never said at all. It okay. was his house. Okay, well, uh, I, think, I think you have said that. That, has been, that allegation has been made, Anne. Holly's here. Do you want to speak to Holly and ask her? No, I don't. No, I, well, I, think no, I didn't think you would. No, I'm glad you said we never said it was the sheriff's house. We had no evidence at that time. So I'm afraid Robert. this is another lot of nonsense you're coming out with. I'd Robert, I'd, 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 I'd you, know the, you know the seven I'd other quit. children that you've named? I, I, sorry? You know the seven other children that you've named? Yes. Two of them weren't born at the time of these allegations. I think that's his, I think you're absolutely wrong there, Mark. Have you spoken to any of these people? I'm not making any comments Have you spoken them. to any of the people that you've said have are part of this pedophile ring. Have you spoken to any of the other victims that you've named? Because These Robert, children that you are that speaking are about are all about adults this. now. Sorry? These children that you are speaking about are all adults. Well, not. Two of them are ten years old. And right? They're not born they at the are time of all the adults. Now that is just a short clip from a podcast that was put out by Keelan Balderson of Wideshut.co.uk back in 2012. It's a lengthy podcast, but it is absolutely worth listening to. I will put it in the show notes for this episode so that you can go and hear the full case that is to be made that the Holly Gregg story ultimately was a hoax of sorts perpetrated on the alt media and perhaps with the, uh, the aid of certain members of the alternative media who continued to promote it after the time at which it became apparent that these uh, claims that were being made did not have the evidence to back them up and were promoted by people who heard the claims, saw that they conformed with what we know, there are political pedophile rings, we know that this happens, and thus assumed it was true and helped to promote it. This should be a cautionary tale about that type of premature activism that we were just talking about that really can turn this open source investigation into nothing more than a witch hunt. And because this definitely pertains to the nature of the open source investigation that we're attempting to do here at CorbettReport.com and more generally in the alternative media, I recently talked to Keelan Balderson about the example of the Holly Gregg story and the Hampstead story and what they teach us about how the alt media functions and how it can function better when it comes to these types of stories. Well, I think we're... We're in a very unique time right now um, where each and every one of us potentially can have a voice that could be spread to thousands and thousands of people online. You know, something you might have just discussed with a few friends down the pub 20 years ago, you can now spread to thousands of people on, on Twitter and Facebook. The nature of the Internet has allowed people to have more of a democratic voice. And I think that is a good thing. Um, it, it makes the democratic process more engaging. Uh, we don't have to rely on the mainstream media or the government to be the sort of purveyors of truth. If something isn't investigated right or, or we think it's not being analysed in the right way or whatever, we can do something about it. We can look at, look at it ourselves and present a different side. That's very much what the, the Corbett Report is and what, what I do at Wide Shut. We kind of try to pick up the slack where we think the mainstream media has failed. But at the same time, if we're going to replace the mainstream um, kind of mechanism of news or the way police investigations are done, if we're going to do sort of our own inquiries or whatever online, um, <clears throat> you kind of see it on Reddit where people identify criminals that have not been identified f through the regular channels, uh, anonymous or whatever, they hack things and they get evidence about crimes that would normally go unnoticed. There is this, this mechanism. But if we're going to go down that road, 
Um, and if we're going to get to the point where we're going to be in the streets protesting and, and putting people's names out there like vigilantes, we better be damn sure that we're correct with the information. We, we better have the evidence and, and a solid foundation for what we believe in. We better hold ourselves to higher standards than the mainstream. Because if we want to challenge them and say, look, you're doing it wrong, I can do it right, then, you know, do it right. Else, what are we really accomplishing? And I guess my fear with cases like the Holly Red case or this recent um, allegations of a, of a satanic cult is that people have failed doing that in, in a spectacular way. And they're drawing conclusions and campaigning based on nothing more than a couple of YouTube videos or something they've heard on a, a, an alternative media outlet. If we're that careless, and I say we, but if people are that careless, you might just be giving the state the perfect reason to clamp down on, on the internet. If we don't use these tools wisely, then they might just take them away from us. You know, there's that old saying, um, with great power comes great responsibility. If we're going to use these tools, then let's be responsible about it. Let's make sure we've got everything nailed down before we just run off like headless chickens, you know, share, share, like, 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 share. Like, just think about what you're doing before that. Once again, Keelan Balderson of Wideshut.co.uk. And once again, the point of this warning at the end of this podcast is not to say that the, this phenomenon does not take place. It documentably, demonstrably does. There are political pedophilia uh, circles. There are pedophile rings that operate in the highest levels of political power, media power, entertainment power, finance and business power. This is a documentable phenomenon. But we do have to be very careful about what information we put forward to the general public because it can quickly come back as egg in our face and discredit all of the real information that exists of these real pedophile rings that really exist. We don't want it to turn into a boy that cries wolf scenario where people don't believe the alternative media because they continue to fall for any hook, line, and sinker story that comes along. But also, we don't want it to undermine the investigations into the real phenomena that, that again, really are taking place. It's a, a delicate procedure to work with information like this that, as I say, does it incite the most uh, fervent passions amongst the public, and deservedly so. So, having said all of that, let us proceed with this open source investigation. Once again, CorbettReport.com members are invited to log in to CorbettReport.com to the uh, comment section of that original open source investigation, which again is linked up in the show notes, or to this post on CorbettReport.com to continue documenting this phenomena and the various examples of it. It is something that, as I say, we're only skimming the surface and trying to encapsulate in general form here on the podcast today. But as I say, there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of links to documents and sources and articles and testimony in that open source investigation that we will continue diving into as these unfolding stories continue to unfold. And that's where I'm going to leave it in your hands, dear capable listener, viewer, reader, to get involved with this open source investigation and start putting some of these puzzle pieces together. We're going to leave things there for today. I'm your host, James Corbett of CorbettReport.com. Thanking you very much for joining me and looking forward to talking to you again very soon. <laughs>